Hi and welcome to Mash Axe. My name is Ben and today I'm going to be talking to you about yeast tips and tricks gathered from a presentation by Chris White from White Labs uh, that he did at Browland in Belgium recently. Now the presentation goes for an hour and 45 minutes which is a long time to sit through so I thought I'd distill down my favorite points into a nice short five minute video. There's heaps of great information in here so let's go check it out. Okay, so White Labs is traditionally a liquid yeast lab. Um, they don't sell any dry yeast, but he did mention briefly the difference between dry and liquid yeast could sort of be thought about like dry uh, milk, so powdered milk and fresh milk. Now, of course, fresh milk is better because it's never been dehydrated and reconstituted. Um, but the handy thing about dry yeast is, of course, that shelf life because it's dehydrated, um, ease of shipping, uh, which makes it quite cheap, in fact, because you can store it for longer. So there are definitely some benefits to dry yeast, but if you want some better beers and more authentic flavors from your yeast, then it's better to go the liquid route. I'd also do some experiments to check out the differences. You know, Take a similar strain of a, a dry yeast and a liquid yeast and see what the differences are for yourself. Now, the one thing he did mention is that you should be rehydrating your yeast. So if you're using a dry yeast packet, make sure you follow the rehydration steps. He couldn't stress that enough. Now the rest of these tips and tricks are about liquid yeast and probably the most important piece of information I took away from the presentation or the most handy was the pitching graph. So it shows you exactly how much liquid yeast and even dry yeast you need to appropriately pitch into your wort to get good healthy fermentation. Now I'm going to show you the graph just now and the important things to take away from this graph are the fact that not only does the batch size matter of course but also the strength of your uh, wort. So if it's a high density wort, a high gravity wort then you're going to need more yeast. And if you're doing a lager yeast, for example, and you're lagering you know, at colder temperatures, you also need much more yeast than you would with an ale yeast. So this graph also takes that into account. And one of my favorite things about this graph is it shows you exactly how many packages and how much of a yeast starter you need. It makes it super simple. And I'd say it's a great stepping stone before you get to um, going to yeast calculators. Like this is just a nice, basic, easy way to go. Now, if you're using a yeast calculator such as Mr. Multi, one thing that Chris mentions is that his new pure pitch technology is actually more viable uh, than normal. So the vitality of your yeast usually goes down month by month and the calculators will say, you know, it may go down by 15% each month. And what he claims is that his pure pitch packages actually retain more vitality. So your yeast is uh, essentially fresher uh, and more viable. Um, and so you should probably take the numbers you get out of the yeast calculators with a bit of a grain of salt, especially when it comes to these new pure pitch packages. And if you want to actually check out the viability for yourself, he does mention that buying a microscope isn't actually too uh, expensive anymore. And it's a great way to check out uh, how viable your yeast is. You're going to need a 400 to 600 power microscope to check out yeast or a 1000 power microscope to check out bacteria. Now, one interesting piece of information I picked up from the presentation was how you need to oxygenate your wort. Now, of course, everyone knows you should get as much oxygen into your wort as possible. Um, and popular sort of method of doing this is to shake the carboy or your fermenter bucket. Now, the goal is to get to eight to 10 parts per million of oxygen. And apparently shaking will only get you to about two or three, despite, you know, popular belief that it will get you all the way. So really the most um, valuable way or the best way to do this is to uh, either get a pure oxygen tank and bubble pure oxygen for about a minute through your wort. Or if you don't want to do that, you can always get a small aquatic pump and pump air through your wort, but you have to do that for quite some time. Making sure you used to have enough oxygen is really important and will definitely make your fermentation go a lot better. I've noticed the results myself immediately when I started using oxygen. Um, and I feel that the fermentation process just goes a lot better. Now, most of us already know this, but temperature is the most critical part of fermentation. You need to stick to the uh, temperature range given by your yeast and should even stick to the colder end of that range as the yeast generate heat as they ferment and uh, that raises the temperature of the entire wort. Even if you're just a couple of degrees over your fermentation range, you can start to generate unwanted flavors such as acetaldehyde, also known as green apples. Now, one thing I didn't realize you could do is actually blend yeast strains together to get the best properties of each. Now, I always thought that yeast strains would kind of compete and kill one another off and like one would dominate, but that's not actually the case in a lot of cases. So what you can do, and this is an example by Chris, is he's taken an American ale yeast and an English ale yeast, 
and he's managed to get a drier beer thanks to the American ale uh, strain, yet he still retained all the fruity esters of the English ale strain to create a truly unique beer. And so what I'd suggest is actually going out, and this is what I'm going to do, is going out and trying various uh, yeast strains together to see what you can come up with. And what's even more exciting is the fact that Chris's lab, and in conjunction with a bunch of others, uh, have actually sequenced the genome of 96 strains of yeast. And what they've come up with is that similar uh, properties of yeast, such as resistance to high alcohol levels, um, are actually genetic. So you'll find that in that case, yeah, if, uh, if it's a wine type of yeast that's really resistant to those high alcohol levels, um, the yeasts that have that property are all genetically similar. Um, and I'll throw up a bit of a graph here just to show you the different groups of yeasts. But I thought this was fantastic because the other thing you can do is actually quantify some of the chemicals that yeast produce. Now one great example he used in his presentation was the banana flavor. Now I can't remember the chemical name, but essentially you can quantify exactly how much of that chemical comes out of different strains of yeast. And since we know the taste threshold of that particular chemical, you can predict which yeasts are going to give you a nice banana flavor and which yeasts are just not going to at all. Now this is especially handy for when you blend those strains of yeast together because you can start to pick and choose which you know, esters and phenols you actually want to get out of your yeasts and uh, what characteristics such as fermenting to a lower final gravity uh, you want to get as well. Now the next set of tips and tricks are all about reusing your yeast. Now of course you've got to somehow harvest that yeast and Chris says it can't be simpler. All you've got to do is take the beer off the top, you know, collect the slurry in a jar and put it in the refrigerator. It doesn't need to be a big stressful deal, that's all you need to do, just keep it simple. And did you know that the only reason that uh, the brewing industry use conical fermenters is to collect yeast? And that fermentation actually works better with a flat dish bottomed fermenter. Now don't bother washing your yeast, you can do it and it does help in some instances. But spent wort actually has some minerals in it as well and it's better to not introduce another thing that could contaminate the yeast. So just go and collect the slurry and put it straight in a jar in the fridge. Now another thing I found out is that top cropping is actually an excellent way to collect yeast as well. Uh, and Chris was surprised that more home brewers don't do it. Now all you need to do is just take a sanitary device, a spoon or something like that, and scrape the yeast off and store about the same amount you would if you were using slurry. Now apparently the quality of the yeast is much better, uh, it's healthy and ready to go, and the only problem really is keeping everything sanitary. Uh, that's the main barrier to entry. But I think I'm probably going to give this a go and see how it goes. So now that you've collected your yeast into a jar, you can just pitch that straight into another fermenter and you're ready to go. But a lot of people have the question, how many times can I just collect and reuse this yeast? Well, Chris mentions that in commercial scales, five to ten times or two months is a good uh, rule of thumb. He did mention that for home brewers, you should probably do it less because there's more risk of contamination. But he did also mention that many people have done it for many more generations and they haven't had any problems. So if you uh, have a good run of luck with that, then that's great, you can do that. And did you know that many commercial breweries actually prefer their third generation of yeast? That apparently has the best flavors because all the strongest yeast have built up and they really hammer out that fermentation. Now one thing he does recommend against is uh, re-pitching a new beer onto an old yeast cake. Now this is called over-pitching and this is dramatically over-pitching. And you probably won't notice anything in that first batch, but after maybe two or three generations, the fermentation start to act funny and you might get some very strange behavior and strange flavor compounds. So he generally recommends just taking the appropriate amount of yeast from that prior batch and re-pitching that. Now having a jar of yeast in the fridge is all well and good, but how long can you keep that jar of yeast in the fridge? Now textbooks will say uh, keep it for one to three days and then make sure you re-pitch within that time frame. Chris recommends that up to two weeks is okay as well. Um, once you get past that point, the yeast is starting to die off and by the time you reach about four weeks, it's probably only about 50% viable. But that's okay because that leads us into our next topic, making yeast starters. So if you have an old jar of yeast or you're just making a particularly large beer or a particularly heavy beer, uh, a yeast starter is a really simple way to go to increase the volume of your yeast, the uh, cell count of your yeast. Now all you need to do is pitch that yeast into a flask um, and essentially you're making a mini beer. So you have a small flask of wort in whatever the size that you need as indicated on the pitching graph uh, and then the yeast will grow over a couple of days and then you have much more yeast to pitch into your real beer. Now one thing Chris mentioned that I thought was very interesting is that he prefers two day old yeast starters. And the reason for this is that the yeast have reached the stationary phase whereby they've collected up, they've fermented out all the sugars and they've collected up all the energy they need to last the entire distance of fermentation. Now if you use a yeast starter at high Krausen instead, 
uh, you might find that it still ferments quite well, but it might not ferment out that last couple of gravity points to make the beer you know, nice and dry or to not leave behind any sugars that shouldn't have been left behind. And finally, one last tip that Chris gives is that you can actually uh, bitter your yeast starter to about 20 IBU um, to act as a bit of an antimicrobial sort of effect. Uh, to keep your yeast safe and uh, sort of keep out all the things you don't want contaminating your yeast starter. Now if you haven't had any problems with this before, it's completely optional so you don't need to do it, but I thought that was a pretty cool tip. And that's it. Hope you've enjoyed this summary. Be sure to check out the full presentation because it has a lot more detail that I wasn't able to cover in this video. And if you've learned anything about yeast, be sure to let me know in the comments section. And if you have any other comments, questions or suggestions, feel free to pop it in there as well. I look forward to seeing you in the next MASHAX video. See you later.